Hello, today is November 15th, 2015 and this is Overgrowth Weekly number 103 with Q&A number 19. My name is Lukas Oshvan. I am Max Steinelson. I'm David Rosen. And I'm Anton Riel. And uh, so last, was it last Friday, last Saturday actually, we released a new update to the game, which was the first update to release in a long time. Uh, what was it, like eight or nine months or something? So let's talk about uh, like how that was, because there were a bunch of new things going on and yeah, a long time since the last release. So, yeah, Anton, do you want to sort of ask questions and like initiate this? Because I think <laughs> I feel like you're you're the one who knows knows stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just sort of wanted to approach maybe some some of the comments that we've received uh, on this last video or on the on the last update and sort of maybe talk about some of the things that we know uh, we want to look at and address moving forward. So um, one of the first things that I see is that uh, some people have been complaining about um, um, like uh, the game not necessarily working as well for them as it was before. And I'm wondering, Max or, or David, do you have any, how are you planning to, to look at um, compatibility across sort of multiple platforms and multiple hardware systems and, and sort of what are the plans to try and resolve playability issues over the next for the next update or the next coming updates? Start with Max. Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Who's going first because there's another collision if I try to talk and um, yeah, um, I can start with at least what I'm thinking. Um, to start with, there has been a lot of like changes in a very uh, many fundamental aspects of the engine, uh, resulting in like uh, probably some regressions and some new incompatibilities. And compatibility work is always ongoing. It gets going to continue, like making sure that it runs for as many people as possible. At the same time, um, now we've um, we've moved away from an older OpenGL version up to a slightly new one. So I've noticed a couple of people, at least like that's been reported to me that were on the fringe before, um, that we are now not compatible with. And they're running hardware that is such, like I think primarily first uncommon uh, and old that we can't really spend time trying to be to, fun to work on those like it's it's what what's been an issue has been integrated all the integrated intel cards um, and uh, it means that we'd have to pop down one step in the OpenGL version numbers and yeah i don't know that really is a call on david um like That's first uh... and foremost but but I, I don't feel like we can fix that otherwise making it run on other computers the normal like the the meaty part it's going to be something we continue working on by just corresponding with the user base so would you would you say that this update to opengl 3.2 core is more um more a cause of the problem for m most people or is it about no. the new features that were added or okay no the move to OpenGL 3.2 core like that in itself is uh, not going to be a big issue. But what it results in is that a lot of other systems have to change when you upgrade. And that may have you know, caused new bugs, causing new issues for new people. Those will be fixed as time goes by and will like, restabilize the engine. I have had a lot of focus on just fixing a lot of crash bugs and it's going to continue making sure that it runs as much as possible. Um, but I just wanted to address like those few instances where it like may make your computer incompatible. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And that is not common. Um, uh, it's, I mean, 3.2 is considered relatively old today by today's standards. I mean, it predates the PS3. Um, wow. So w what, what is the actual current OpenGL? Like what, what if, if you were to update to the newest version? 4.4 uh, or 4.5 is soon coming out. Uh, I think the, the the last revision for 3.2 was in 2009. Uh, so, but, 
but like it, it had some early releases before then. So like this is the, the computers that we've come across uh, are the Intel graphics uh, 3000 series and the, the incompatibility with 3.2 seems to be mainly artificial like Intel just didn't want to implement that standard. I'm not 100% sure if they could. I think they could because they have support for DirectX 10 which is the corresponding version of DirectX. Uh, okay. Which you also need to run Windows Seven, for example. So if you can run like Windows, like Windows Seven, you should be able to run a three point two. Uh, but there are some drivers that don't support it, for whatever reason. Um, David, did you want to comment on any of that? Well, that? OpenGL three point two, we kind of picked that because it's a sweet spot of compatibility. Like it goes back to Mac OS ten point six. And which was which was when they did they made a big push at ten point six for um, certain up driver updates, right? Is that yeah true? Yeah, and that was a really long time ago. Like we're up to what like ten point ten, ten eleven now. Really, so, yeah. El Capitan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just like if it doesn't work, like you probably can't run any other game. No, not a modern game released today that isn't two dimensional and runs on some older engine. Like uh, 3.3 is the, I think, the most common that 3D engines run on today when they're backwards compatible. Um, that makes sense. Um, so 3.2 is actually, for us, it is a pretty conservative like uh, approach. If we had been a little bit more liberal and crazy, we could have gone for something newer. But I think, like David's saying, 3.2 is a very is a sweet spot. It gives us a lot of nice new tools. Um, and a lot of nice like aspects of the newer OpenGL standards that will help us develop. Uh, yeah. It has sort of uh, has that already been like helping with the new features that we've been adding in terms of graphics and stuff. Have we we've been using OpenGL 3.2 for those things? There are a few features that are used now that weren't that we couldn't do before, like the instancing of static objects and none of the new lighting would be possible at all. The sending in like tetrahedral meshes in the texture buffer objects. Data pushing is a lot easier and shader writing too. Like he's doing something a little bit more loose on the graphics card, that, you know, programmatic, not being so stuck with the pipeline, fixed pipeline, it helps. Hmm. We can also do more deferred stuff, I think, hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's a lot of stuff on about the graphics and uh, yeah, just people should keep reporting bugs to make sure that uh, we know about them so that we can fix the bugs that come up and, uh, and, and so on. And I, I'd like to add, like the people that had come to me with the issue, I, I've told them that like um, if you feel cheated, of course, like the, the refund policy applies, right? Because if you bought the game for your computer and your computer can't run the game anymore, it's it's like a, we don't we're we unhappy with that of course, um, but like like they said like it, like when SDL dropped Commodore sixty four supports there there was someone left out right, but it did help the overall advancement of of the project. Right. So so, so you guys can send reports to bugs at wolffire dot com, and it's not necessarily an interactive email address, but it it does mean that we we get it in our logging system and we will take a look at your bug at some point. Um, some get higher priority, some are easier to resolve than others. Um, and often so, people report the same bugs, so they just get, we combine them into a folder to get an idea of how many people are having this particular bug, but we won't respond to every single person. Right, we might start doing that because some bugs are of course overreported. Uh, if we do a breaking release of something, uh, that bug, like there was an arena crash bug. Uh, I think we had 50 reports of that in 209. But right. it's better to report than not. Uh, I will sort through them. <laughs> and uh, I, like you said, Anton, you won't always get a response. Um, I try to stay on top of it, but as it currently stands, there are over four and a half thousand uh, tickets in the system. And yeah, it's a lot of like, it, it, it just going through it takes time. Right. And and some some of those four and a half thousand have already been resolved, I'm sure, and yeah. maybe not categorized and just verifying that they've been sh the, the fixed takes time, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, Rodigia asks uh, if um, with these new uh, enhanced graphics settings, are there going to be toggles to enable or disable them? Specifically, he's asking if PBR is implemented, uh, the HDR and the Bloom settings, are those things that will be turned on or off? I think um, he's probably probably making incorrect assumptions about what is causing performance issues on his system. Because those are all fairly, very lightweight features in terms of performance. So it's likely it could even be something on the CPU that's totally unrelated to graphics. We'd have to right. do some tests. It's very easy to accidentally toss in a small thing in one small patch that will just eat up CPU time. Um, so it's easy for us to accidentally release a patch that has bad performance somewhere. But at the same time, they're usually equally easy to find and fix. Um, so, so maybe not from a performance aspect, but what if you hate the way that that things look when it's in HDR? What if you're like, no, I don't like it to look more like real life. Make it look cartoony and, and terrible. Um, can, <laughs> you, can you maybe still turn it off? Um, is, is, That's probably just going to be a mod someone can make if they want to. Because <laughs> yeah. right. it's all shader stuff, all right? Shadows. It's all shader stuff, right? So you can just write your own shader that doesn't have that stuff in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, with the new modding framework, uh, a modder could, maybe not right now, but potentially in the long run, like even be able to mod some shaders and then put in their, their own configuration. Right. Uh, yeah, like there's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, anything that I think is easy to turn on and off in our pipeline that we end up with in a rendering, we can like throw in an, a boolean for. But I don't think like David's in on here. Like if if it requires a rewrite from our side, um, probably isn't worth the effort. Right, and especially if these are really small uh, changes anyway, which we sort of are assuming they are, uh, meaning that they're they're lightweight they're not really impacting a lot of CPU or GPU cycles. It's not a huge, um, it's probably not what he's experiencing. No, I mean, it shouldn't cause the, the performance issues. Uh, another aspect to, really like to consider there is that everything that we add that can be changed is something we have to test and uh, <laughs> make sure it works for new releases. So like, there are a lot of aspects to consider there. Uh, it isn't as easy to put it in there and forget about it. Things can always come and bite you later. I guess I will kind of taking the role there as the conservative uh, programming lead, uh, but yeah. Right. So to switch gears entirely, um, with the last release, we uh, had a link to a longer change log, which I think is useful because then we can have just like the important points for those people who care, and then we have like a huge document with almost all of the changes in it. <clears throat> That I think Max, you generate that from the actual git commits, right? The long thing, and then like uh, yes, I I uh, I used a little script, and then it 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 uh, it popped out like all the I think it was you know, at least seven hundred changes since uh, we switched to Git from SVN, mm -hmm. and then I went through them manually and re took out the ones that were actually like relevant to an outstanding. Mm -hmm. So it's a revised list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know if uh, is there any way to check how many people have watched that? Maybe we could like ask the chat. Like, do do people like that? Do people like having the long change log and the short change log? Yeah. yeah. Did did anyone actually look at the long one? Because I think it was what like six pages of changes. Or yeah, it was a bit long. <laughs> um, so, you know, let us know if if it was cool to see how many bug fixes actually went into the episode, and if you didn't. Um, we can link it to you now if you guys want to check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so like that change log was really meant for the the most like technically inclined, interested fans. Um, <laughs> th there were a lot of like you know deep changes, a lot of fixes throughout that that period of time, and for the people who were really curious about what was going on, I felt that that was like a thing that was just fair to give out for them, right? Um, because I mean. It, 
a person who's just playing the game for fun isn't probably going to be too affected by that information. Yeah. That's why we have the, the you know, the, the really filtered bullet points that you basically covers features that are features for the end user. Right. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Posted a link to that in the chat for people who might want to, who didn't see it or something and want to check it out. We we'll probably put that also in the bullet point for the end of the of this the recorded version. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, we we said that we were going to have like a bi-weekly schedule for uh, for alpha releases. Do we think that's uh, still like something we can do? Uh, is that still feasible? Is that? Hmm. So. Uh, yes, it's. I think it's definitely feasible. Um, this alpha coming up might not be a meaty one. Uh, personally, I've been focusing a lot on um, on just like the the more background stuff. I've set up uh, a build system for the game now, so that we automatically release. Uh, that will also help with the, the alpha releases, meaning that there's less manual work involved. Um, Can you talk about when people should expect to see? Or what when these when these build server builds happen, when might you see them happening? Yeah, so um, I have the the internal testing now every night, uh, American time around twelve uh, Western Pacific uh, LA time, twelve at night. It finishes around one a.m. Um, it will be like updated into t internal testing on Steam, uh, open for anyone who is like a really hardcore fan and wants to see what's going on right now. Uh, that updates if there has been a change in our main line. Um, so, so basically, if a change has happened, it will be yeah. pushed to the internal build on a nightly basis. Yes, and I'm planning on like maybe having a simple notification bot in the IRC chat uh, about that, uh, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, I, I had the build bot from the built-in build system, but that was a bit spammy and. I think it opened up one or two too many security holes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do something more filtered. But yeah. Uh, it was, it was also pointing to local host changes or something. Yeah, not anymore. Um, but that's for another day. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's externally ac accessible now, but you have to log into it. Um, yeah, so you will notice that there has been an update by the, uh, the the version number changing at the bottom of the screen in the main menu when you start the game. Uh, there's the it says two ten yeah, alpha alpha two ten, and then it's a dash and then a number, and that number after the dash says how many commits there have been since that uh, alpha was tagged and released. So that's like the the way you can see if it's changed, um, if you miss the fact that Steam updated your game. Mm. Right. I don't know if it saves some logs somewhere as well. I will try to also have the IRC be informed, but we'll see when that happens. So yeah, with all these changes that you've been working on, um, we're going to see more updates. Like It's going to increase our productivity going forward, but that means that yeah. you haven't been able to work on the actual game for, for this upcoming update. So no. uh, since uh, David is also working on a different project right now, that means we have Micah, who is still working on the arena stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be finished for the next alpha, so we might just have like a few new levels or something for this one. Yeah. But we want to have something new. Every alpha, of course. I mean, yeah. there isn't much point to releasing alpha unless there's at least a little bit of meat on the bones, right? Yeah. Bug fixes are great too, but it's not what we want to, like that isn't what creates interest and hype for the game. Exactly, that's sort of like what I'm what I'm thinking about. Like, do we actually want to make an alpha video about this alpha, for instance? Because it's just going to be like a few new levels. It's going to be like, I don't know, less than a minute video probably. Because not a lot of stuff has happened, I suppose. Um, or do we just like do just a blog post release? Do we release it at all? Because um, we're on this schedule now, that's what we've said. So we should be releasing something, I feel like. Right. I think we still have, I think we still have time to get stuff done. Um, our our last, uh, you know, when when there were weekly updates, it was a you know weekly build. So um, even if it's a small update, I think we can can do something. It feels a little weird because we're sort of at the midway point right now, and 
the focus has been on very back end mm -hmm. yeah we're still preparing for stuff we're still like doing the entire like going to a bigger team thing that's why max is working on the build bot stuff but once all of this stuff is done that's going to save much time for us in the future right so yeah how, how is the hiring feeling at this point david and, and how are you feeling about the the new team are there more people that you're looking for um i'm pretty happy with it i think for now i probably won't be looking for new people well i guess i'm kind of looking for animators but haven't actually put down an ad yet and um if you do animation, if you if you hire animators, would they be animating still primarily the way that you animate with a, a small number of keyframes, with a lot of um, uh, uh, inverse kinematics, or and 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 uh, the automatic animation, or or would they be doing maybe more keyframes per animation? Well, some of our animation systems are more procedural than others, like the. The combat animations are much less procedural than the general movement ones. The main priority for the combat animations is just to break, break it down into pieces and have variations for all the different things that can happen. Which is basically just if you're doing a strike, if it's blocked or not. So if you have like follow through or if you have to bounce back. Right. So those... The combat animations are a bit more traditional. Okay, makes sense. Is there a lot more movement to be done, or is is it primarily combat remaining to be animated? I think it's like more movement too, and also making sure that the different races move differently, because right now they're sharing all of the same animations, mm -hmm. which looks odd. Everyone's now. Some, some things look odd, but at the same time, it's amazing how scalable it really has been. Um, for sort of how few animation, you know. I'm always surprised see? how well it works with crazy mod characters like yeah. Sintel or Kanoko or the alien. Yeah. Um, there have been very few animation, like it, it, when it's scaled to another character, there have been very few times when I've gone, oh, that just looks wrong and horrible. And most of the time that I felt like that, it's because someone included a custom animation that just looked wrong and horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with new movements for the different characters, it's not because they look wrong right now. It's just that they don't express the differences between the races, which is kind of adding new content instead of just making it work. Right. Right. Cats are supposed to be a little bit more like light in the foot. Uh, d dogs and wolves are a bit heavier. Yeah. They all have yeah. different attitude. Yeah, different right. feel in their movement. How would would you just focus on race, or would you ever give custom animations to a specific character if they required it, like Whale Man? Or uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I guess that's another race. But say say you did like a, you know, like a really like an alpha wolf that needs to sort of be more dominating over the rest of the pack. Would you do custom animations for that character? That would be ideal, but one thing at a time. <laughs> of course. Animations are not e even the priority right now, so which is why I haven't put out the ad yet. But right. I definitely want to get more specialists as they come up. And I might hire one more programmer. I'm still looking at Brian Cronin from Unknown Worlds. Cool. Yep, yep. So, should we should we should we talk about um Speaking of characters and, and additional people, you want to move on with mm -hmm. that? Okay. So yeah, going into more of like what's been what we've been doing for the game, I suppose. So we recently, uh, Ragdoll Zombie came on as a volunteer on the team, and uh, they've been helping visualizing Steve's character concepts in 3D. And they just started out, so. Uh, I think one model is fine, like done so far, but it seems to be something that's actually useful. So we might be looking at other ways to like get more volunteers. But right now, I'm sort of like there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and I'm I'm not sure if I if I would have the time to like organize everything around that. 
but this is like sort of a first test and we'll see we'll, we'll see how it works out after that after after this um, and yeah in the past two weeks uh, what have we been working on I've been well I made the alpha video I've been organizing the team with Ryan some more uh, I've been testing out git large file storage git LFS as an alternative to Dropbox because that's gonna help us out with the releasing it on Steam and stuff automatically because it can like download all the right assets right from the Git repository instead of having to have all the versions use the same Dropbox folder which is what happens right now. Yeah, I mean we'll be, we'll be able to go back in time. Exactly. That, that's the biggest win, um, I think. And it will also reduce the risk of accidentally removing things without noticing it until it's much, much later. Mm -hmm. And Max, you've already talked about like what you've been doing in the build bot stuff, I suppose. Yeah, the build system. A uh, lot of work there. Mm -hmm. But okay. I think it will pay off a lot of time in the long run. Absolutely, I'm sure it will. Like you said, it t takes like one hour to release on all three platforms now. Uh, and you yeah, have to push one button and then it does it in one hour. Yeah. yeah. Assuming that all the data underlying works. Like if, mm. if, if I code it correctly and it compiles on all the three platforms, it takes an hour from the time that I want it to be released for it to be on Steam. Which is pretty damn sweet. Pretty damn sweet. That's, a pretty, that's a pretty simple uh, work process. So. Yeah, I mean, I can iterate like more reasonably. I can, ha I can have uh, something out to mainly our own developers uh, if there's a fix on something that broke. It's very useful. Right. Uh, having a team like this, we can't expect everybody to have a fully functioning compile system on their own machine. Mm. Man, and why not? <laughs> <laughs> because we're not in the same office and I can't come and help people in person. <laughs> no, but I mean, even big companies that have people working uh, at the same spot, the compile takes so long that it isn't worth time and effort and right. required skills to do it. Like, why would you educate an animator into it if they're not going to actually use it? Right. And uh, David, you have been working on the secret project. Do you want to like? I'm not sure how much you're ready to reveal about it since it's you know, a secret project and all. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what can you tell us about it? Like, what are you doing? Well, I'm working on this sniper project, which Aubrey and I occasionally stream on Twitch. And that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, make sure you follow David and Aubrey on Twitch to get all the clues about what this project actually is going to be in the end. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, and I, uh, uh, yeah. I, I was going to say I too have been working a little bit on that secret project. Um, uh. I've written a bit of music, and uh, as well as some new music for Overgrowth. I've been. <laughs> I've been trying to split my time between my TV show, uh, Overgrowth, this project, uh, and another short film, and a, uh, and, and a CD project, and you know, it's it's been a crazy couple of weeks for me, <laughs> um, but uh, still kind of exploring what we're gonna do for this sniper game for music, but it should be interesting. Should so. be. Uh... And uh, yeah, like we mentioned before, uh, Mike has kept working on the arena. Um, I've been sort of out of the loop what people have been doing in general, I feel like, but yeah, people have been doing stuff for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of us were a little bit like, I think stressed out for the release. And uh, me personally, I've like, I've allowed myself to, uh, to take it a little bit easy this week because of all the extra hours. Um, mm -hmm. like it's, it's important to be able to relax a little bit. Yep. Uh, but we're, we're going to have to sync up now on Monday and see what everyone is doing. Yeah. Definitely. Like it, I think it helps with, if anything, it helps with motivation. Yeah, for sure. That's sort of what I've been doing now mostly is trying to just figure out how do we um, how do we handle a long distance team without meetings and stuff because usually you can just like oh just have one big meeting every week and then everyone knows what's going on um, can't do that here yeah I mean there's nine hours between me and you right now mm. um, that is a pretty big gap 
Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. I think I think we can figure it out somehow. Definitely. I, mean, I think flexible. we have people all the way around the world. I think we have people in Australia too, right? Oh, isn't right? Maybe isn't Marcus there? I think. I don't know. Um, or maybe he was. I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't. Anyway. I don't see geography. Um, just a blank. <laughs> Should be. Should we ask some questions? <laughs> we should. We should. <laughs> so uh, yeah, long, uh, long developer talking this time, but let's go into questions. So I'll take this question by Wake. He asks, "What resources? What resources do you use to learn OpenGL core profile?" And uh, I guess David could start with that since you recently did upgrade the engine. Um, one of the resources I was using was a kind of an online book at Arc Synthesis. I think it might be gone now, <laughs> but I'm sure someone backed it up somewhere. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm looking at my shelf. I'm trying to see the, the book that I used. <laughs> Sorry, continue. <laughs> so, what sort of book? Like, do is it gone? If in that case, I guess it's sort of we don't even need to talk about it. But I was going to ask, like, what sort of book was it? Is it like strictly reference or? Well, it was kind of a tutorial series, a bit like the Neon Helium tutorials used to be. That's how I learned OpenGL in the first place. And most of that is really legacy, like OpenGL 1.0 type stuff. Mm. And this one was more modern, like core, sending everything through buffers. And, but I'm not sure what's the current best resource. So... Because the one I was using seems to have disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> Which is unfortunate. Yeah. So... If, uh, me then, um, uh, five years at university, but uh, <laughs> to be serious about it. Um, so there are two big aspects to, to 3D rendering, which doesn't like, this is what differentiates it from, or yeah, change, yeah, makes it different from other um, aspects of programming is that it's very heavy on the theory. Um, so what you need to have a grasp of is first the concept of rendering and like some literal algebra, which sounds more complicated than it actually is. It's like, you know, the simplest form of math. And uh, then it's the handling a complicated, stupid C API from the 90s. Um, so for, the, for the, the rendering aspect, if you want a book that just covers general rendering for any kind of API, uh, Real-time rendering was my course literature, and I think it was pretty good. I think Lucas had it too in his courses. Mm -hmm. It has the sack boy on the front of it. Uh, it, it. It covers the basics and forward, all the theory of how to render. And when it comes to just understanding OpenGL, I think the Super Bible, which is like basically the official book, OpenGL Super Bible, it's unbeatable in that respect. Isn't that split up into two books though? Like, uh, yeah, one, there's the like tutorial like and the something. programmer manual, and I would probably just, like, if you want to really go into it, get both and then switch between them, depending on your mood and what you're doing. Because one is like step for step, into, like instructions on how to perform something, and the other one explains, uh, like the individual calls and what they do. So they have, uh, you know, slightly different views on it. The same thing, but it's kind of necessary because OpenGL, especially, is such a big and messy um, beast to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find the one because I had a very specific book that I looked at when I learned OpenGL. It was, uh, yeah, the orange OpenGL book, I suppose. OpenGL Programming Guide, 8th edition, is what I used. Is that an online version thing too? I use an online, like, no, it's like, there is a book. But yeah. I have an electronic book, if that's what right. you meant. I also know that there is another, like, relatively new online project, and it, like, covers things like WebGL. And things. Mm. Uh, the nice thing is that you can often translate the knowledge of OpenGL to WebGL and the 
uh, GLES. So these are like the web browser one, the phone one, and the computer one. They're very similar. Um, yeah. So, so if you understand one. That's a lot of a lot of resources if you want to learn uh, OpenGL, I suppose. <laughs> um, Wake also asks: Will you consider resharing the best game development articles? And, uh, I I remember there was a blog post at one point, quite a long time ago now, I guess, um, where that was the case. You, where David, I think it was you who just went through all of the rendering um, technologies that you had made blog posts about in the past and you just put them together into one big blog post. Maybe. I'll link that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so is this... Um, I'm guessing that means that it's something that we might do again in the future if we see that there's a like good, good reason to do it, I suppose? I think so. I'd like to write some more articles at some point on our new graphics because there are a lot that we haven't written anything about. We've also never written like about the blood system or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that could be cool. Um, I don't know if there would be. I mean, it could be cool maybe to have like a flashback article to like these are all of the like alphas that have happened or something where you just go through like the progress of the start from the start to to the end or something like that that could be a cool like sort of that type of thing but he's more asking about the best game development articles i'm not sure if he is talking about just articles from the wolfire blog then or articles in general but yeah uh, hmm. I don't know too much about the other game development articles. Mm. It's hard to keep on track. <clears throat> but I guess if we find one, we will probably share it on Twitter or something. That's I think that's the most common place to do that. So yeah, at Wolfire on Twitter. <laughs> if, if you want to be there, just in case. Just in case. Um, so, shall we take one more question? We've gone like a bit over time, but I feel like so much development talk. Do you guys have time to keep going for a while? I do. I was going to say we could answer um, this this one that I have selected right now. We could talk about it because I think it's an interesting topic, and I can talk about it for a little bit. Yes. <laughs> question seven A. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so this is a question from Rodeje that he asked in the in the chat, he's asking, so I have a question. He learned two weeks ago about what binaural audio is, and he thinks that overgrowth should have it. He means if someone is behind you, you can hear it. The advantage is we can place uh, where sound is coming from just in real life. Um, and then he talks about how it needs a headset um, and things like that. So um, I think there's sort of two, there's a sort of a two prong answer to this question is basically, um, what do we think of binaural audio and how how could we incorporate binaural audio into a game like Overgrowth? So um, the first thing that I'll say is that binaural audio is a, is a recording technique more than it is a playback technique. So um, what it has to do with is a, they use a dummy head. We'll just talk about it real quick. A dummy head with microphones in their ears and you record um, sound from uh, you know, you, you record sound with this head and basically because it has physically modeled ears, it creates what's called the head related transfer function, which is how your brain perceives localization or where a sound is coming from as it's being recorded. So a lot of this happens um, through filters and through other things like, like that. Now, because of how it's recorded, the only way that you can fully play it back properly is by using headphones, something placed against the ears uh, so that your ears don't then change the sound. So the, the pin is the outside of the ear and that really adjusts the way that you hear things. Um, and it filters things if they're coming from behind you, filters it less if it's coming directly in front of you and medium from the side. 
things like that. So um, anyway, my point is that it's, it's more of a recording technique than it is a, an audio playback technique. However, David has actually studied rendering audio in three dimensions, which maybe he could talk about a little bit. Yeah, back in school, I was really interested in that subject. And it's kind of spatialization is to some extent a solved problem already because there are all these head related transfer functions out there. So you can take any sound and convolve it with these samples that are recorded in like binaural recordings of like generic impulses and that will localize the sound. The harder part is making it sound like it's in a specific environment, which is not a huge prior priority in overgrowth because we don't have gunshots, which are the primary way that you would hear really loud impulses in a game. Like with gunshots, you almost don't hear the gunshot itself at all. All you're hearing is, is just like sounding the environment with a very strong shock wave. But overgrowth with normal sounds, we don't have to worry about that as much. So it'd be nice to go through. Well, one thing I'd really like to do is at least have an option where you can say if you're using speakers or headphones, because then you need kind of a totally different rendering method. Like with headphones, if there's a sound to the right, you'll hear it in your right ear and then you'll hear it in your left ear also, just slightly different with a sound shadow from your head and a slight delay. But if you're on speakers, then if it sounds to the right, you only want it to play on the right speaker and not on the left speaker at all. So definitely need to add an option for that at some point. Mm, but that also depends on if you have your speakers in the right configuration so that you're hearing a, a proper 3D space or, or if, if you have proper um, uh, imaging on your speakers because that can really affect the way you hear it as well. Um, That's true. I think <laughs> most gamers will just leave it at the default settings, whatever they are. But it, it's good to the, have something special for the audio files. <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons that that having speakers is different than headphones is because you get um, what's called crosstalk. So when you have a speaker in the room and you, you play something from the right from the right speaker, say, as David was saying, and you want it to sound primarily on the right side, some direct signal hits the right side of the ear, some hits the left, and then also it reflects in the room that you're actually in. So the room that you're in plays a, a big, important role in acoustics with speakers. So if you have your speakers pressed up against the wall, you'll hear um, a lot of reflections off the wall and it can really diffuse the sound so that the localization, again, the ability to pinpoint where an object is coming from, um, much more difficult. Um, and then, and then there's, <laughs> there's always this, this, you know, we have a lot of sampled head related transfer functions that David mentioned, um, but no head related transfer function. It, it's a, it's a series of averages as opposed to, um, a specific, uh, um, like it's, it's not so specific to your ear. So your ear, like your own personal head related transfer function, if you could apply that instead of having this generic um, averaged head related transfer function would give you a much better result than if you were to um, just use the average. <laughs> so. I think this whole field of spatialization is gonna advance pretty rapidly in the next few years as we have all these billions of dollars poured into VR research, where all these VR headsets have headphones built in and they really want to like sell you on an immersion. That's gonna be a big part of it. Right. And it would be easy enough to, to with those types of headphones, have small microphones in your ears to sort of record your, your own head related transfer function as you're playing the game. It, it's not, you know, you could in theory sample people's, um, you know, HRTF as you go. That's true. <laughs> We're not going to try and further the state of the art of head related <laughs> transfer functions in overgrowth. But so I think the answer to Rodeje's question is that we already have something 
pretty similar to that in the game that with headphones, you should already be able to localize pretty accurately um, where things are coming from. We have three-dimensional audio. It's an ambient space. And then also um, where <laughs> sounds are occurring in the game are already occurring within this 3D field. Um, and that anything anything more specific to that will be what David was talking about, where you might have a, a headphone versus speaker setting that would in essence just uh change the mix slightly in the in the real-time playback engine Did you say that's correct yeah the only thing that i can think of that is in between those is that we i don't think we have sound occlusion i think i'm sure we do actually we do okay i just i have missed that part of the engine and there's so much open space in the game but i haven't noticed <laughs> yeah. it yet well, I think it makes the sounds open half volume yeah. if they're occluded. Okay. And do we have reflections in the game too? No reflections right now. No reflections. Okay. We yeah. just haven't made audio a priority. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like these are, yet. <laughs> they're super esoteric questions for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though. But uh, we have been going uh, quite a bit over the time. So I think we're going to start wrapping things up about now. Oh, I, I think we could answer this one question that showed up just now, this last one from Alan Haugen. I will Why actually, you... while you answer that, I will just set up the fan art watch uh, or try okay. to do that in time. So we have that. See, why did you ever consider swapping the engine? Well, I had been spending a lot of time on the engine features. And for game jams, I had been using other engines like Unity and Unreal. And then I was pretty successfully completing a whole game in a week or a week and a half. So I was just thinking maybe that was a factor that maybe switching to another one would make it go faster. But then, so we did some experiments and I think that's not, that wasn't a good idea for various reasons. Right. So, yeah, ab about those reasons, I guess, have we gone through that uh, properly? I think, I feel like we've gone through those reasons a few times, so we might not have to. Yeah, I think we talked about that last time. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'm just setting up the uh, fan art watch here now. That's what I'm doing. Um, so, one second. I'm sorry. So yeah, I think that marks the end of the show. Then I will uh, finish up the fan art watch stuff when we've signed off and then I'll, I'll show those to you during the outro so yeah check out OG Weekly on Twitter and on YouTube uh, as well as ogweekly.com for all the archives and then we have a bunch of Twitter channels but I think at Wolfire is the, probably the most important ones if you, one if you want to follow us on Twitter so yeah thank you everyone for tuning in and we will see you again in two weeks Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.